that was Danny Porter. Now, you know, it's good to note he is the district attorney elected in Gwinnett County, and he is the one trying this case, first chair, and that was his opening statement. I'm really excited to have my special guest, LaDawn Jones, who's a criminal defense attorney, join me from Atlanta. Ironic, we're both sitting here in New York when we both actually practice in Atlanta, Georgia. That's right. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on. Excellent. So let's jump right into it. Talk to me about, number one, in your experience, do you have many criminal defendants who represent themselves? They have a right to do that, but go forward without an attorney. It is very rare because for a lot of reasons. One, people try to stop defendants from representing themselves. There's too many legalities. The court, the law is required to instruct them several times and in some cases still appoint counsel to sit with them even if they represent themselves. Because of a case as serious as this, you need representation. But then even more than that, once they get into the courtroom and they look into the jurors' eyes and the whites of their eyes, that tends to make them say, you know what, I can't handle this alone. It says a lot about a defendant who wants to represent themselves. Right. And so in this case, I have to point out, there are attorneys on call that are seated in the back, two attorneys, I understand, taking notes. She still has elected not to have an attorney, but let's take it the next step. She also has not yet cross-examined any witnesses. She did not make an opening statement. What do you make of that in terms of this defendant? So if she had a lawyer not making an opening statement, it may not be that weird. There are many attorneys who reserve. They like to wait to see what happens, what evidence the case will, uh, the state will present, how the jury is feeling it, and then they present their case because you see a turn um, in the cases. If you give an opening, you give away your hand a little bit. But in this case, a pro se defendant choosing not to make an opening statement, I don't know if she's fully taking in uh, what may happen by not telling her side of the story to the jurors. You know, it's interesting. So you know this is a death penalty case. I, as a judge, here's what I do. If I have a defendant representing themselves, I don't only inform them of their right to counsel up front. I do it throughout the trial. So if I had a defendant that's not doing any cross-examination, I would remind her on the record and say, just reminding you, you have a right to be represented by an attorney if you choose not to exercise that right, but one can be appointed for you if you can't afford one. We have one here who's been in the courtroom. I would want her to answer on the record, do you understand your rights, yes or no? Do you want an attorney, yes or no? This judge at this point in time hasn't done that. Do you think that's an appealable mm -hmm. issue? You know, I think one warning is sufficient. I'm sure there were some pretrial determinations when they appointed the assistant counsels to come in to make sure that she clearly knows her rights. I think judges like you who are great who do that, make sure that a defendant doesn't change their mind because court can be very intimidating. But even if she does, if she has been rightfully informed at least one time on the record and she has confirmed verbally on the record, I don't think that she can appeal it at this point. And, you know, it's my understanding competency, Vincent Hill is there on the ground and he said competency was raised but the judge's response was listen she seems to be engaged I've seen her smile I've seen her facial expressions I don't have any concerns about her competency to go forward. So again, how could competency of the defendant be an appealable issue or not in a case like this? So it depends on what the judge knew at the time. Again, they made this finding on the record. They, I'm sure they went through some of the colloquy questions. Do you understand? How much can you read and write? To make sure she understood that she was waiving any competency and inform her that she has the right to be evaluated. But I am certain a defendant who is representing them themselves also has a hard time uh, understanding any mental health issues that they have. The court has no evidence that she had prior mental health issues, um, and there's been nothing that was presented before the court to give the court or the state reason to have pause. She may not have an appealable issue there if she's had the opportunity to be evaluated and have the court take that into consideration. Right. Now, in my experience, Gwinnett County is the one that they really know what they're doing. They're very professional. They're very ethical. They do the right things. And so I have no doubt that those safeguards are being followed, right? So what's interesting, though, is we just know if you watch her during the opening statement, she also doesn't act out. She doesn't seem remorseful. She doesn't cry. What I want to do now is take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about this trial here on Law and Crime. Welcome back. We are switching gears. We have a lot to cover today. We're going to talk now again about Newman Raja. This is the one that was convicted of 
manslaughter as well as attempted first degree murder in the death of Corey Jones, who was a stranded motorist at the side of the road. A very passionate closing argument by the prosecutor in this case. LaDawn, let me bring you back in and tell me this. First of all, she says to the jury, do not give him a pass because he's law enforcement. In your experience, does that happen? Does law enforcement get treated differently? It happens all the time, particularly when they are acting as witnesses in any criminal trial. One, they know the lingo, so they sound like they, they are aware of the law. Uh, they practice presenting before court as part of their job, and so they present very well. And then we're taught in America that we are they're there to protect and serve. So they are automatically given a higher degree of belief simply from being a police officer. However, in this case, they're normally not the defendant and the police officer. But even then, I think the same rules will apply. And do you think those rules apply, devil's advocate, this age and time when regrettably we see officer shootings and we see officers being tried for cases in cases like this where we know after hearing all the evidence for instance the officer admits he pulled his van in front of the car which is not at all what an officer should do he did not follow the different policies procedures rules so really in this day and age is it surprising to you that he did get convicted for manslaughter and attempted murder it's not surprising at all. So balancing both sides. On the one hand, people already come into the courtroom with a bias. Either they believe that there is a problem with excessive force or they do not before they walk in the courtroom. But if they follow the instructions given by the court to look at the evidence in the case, then they're left with the other side of saying, well, a police officer has more knowledge. They have training. They have practice. So we expect them to act with a higher level of care, which I think can work against a police officer when they walk in. So was that a successful argument? LaDawn, what do you think of the argument? Listen, this is not a crime that happened at 3.15 in the morning. Rather, he did not wake up thinking, I'm going to go find someone to murder. Who am I going to kill? It was an accident. What do you make of that defense? You know, I wonder if that is very persuasive to the jurors. Does it really matter what you planned on getting up that morning, right? He's not charged with an intentional malicious murder, right? This is a manslaughter type charge. Uh, so that doesn't matter as much. And it's also odd that uh, the defense is going down the road of, well, this is not a race related murder. Per your last question, right now in America, these are very sensitive topics. And I think it would have behooved him to take time to really parse that out so that he can address each of the individual jurors' potential biases on that issue. Now, oh, that's an excellent point. So let me ask you this. The manslaughter manslaughter conviction was manslaughter by culpable negligence while armed. Put that in plain speak for all of us. What does that mean? So when you are in certain positions like a police officer, there are requirements that you have. And if you do not meet those requirements, you are negligent. And so what they are saying is that he was not intentionally trying to kill this person. It wasn't a malicious killing where he came in and planned. He was being negligent in his duties while having a firearm and having that firearm result to end the death of an individual. And you know, we heard the video earlier that he, uh, the audio, excuse me, earlier that he fired shot after shot after shot. So this is where we are on this case with the victim, Corey Jones, the deceased. We're talking about the Newman Raja matter and listening to closing arguments in that case from the trial where he was convicted of two different charges, a manslaughter conviction, as well as a attempted and attempted first degree murder. Now, I can tell you that we are seeing what is going on in the courtroom live. And in this case, they are waiting for the sentencing hearing to begin. Let's just point out that is the defendant, Newman Raja, and he certainly looks different than he appeared during the course of his trial. He was clean shaven. He just looked a little bit different. Now, one of the things my producer pointed out is he was on house arrest prior to being tried for the crime and after he was convicted, then he was taken into jail. He has been in jail since that time. Here he is at the sentencing hearing. What I'd like to do is while we're waiting on that to begin, let's talk about, talk to us, LaDawn, about sentencing hearings and what we can expect. What do each side have the opportunity to present? 
So this is not another trial of the facts of the case that has been determined. So now what we're talking about is what is the appropriate sentence based on the facts. So they'll talk about the unintentional nature of the shooting. They'll talk a little bit about who Raja is as a person, what he has done in the community, and try to convince the court to sentence on the lowest possible end of the sentencing guidelines or whatever the sentencing may be in that state. They're going to work on trying to convince the judge, the jury, anyone who's listening, that the sentencing in this case um, should be in line with who he was prior to this incident. Okay, so in talking about the sentencing, let's just say on the manslaughter conviction, he faces up to 30 years in prison, and then on the attempted first degree murder, he faces 25 years to life. In your opinion, what do you think is more likely, a life sentence or maybe 25 years? You know, it's very difficult to tell. One of the things I would look at is what does the judge normally do in these cases and what type of evidence was presented? Interesting turn of events. So instead of the defense now presenting their witnesses on the sentencing, they're making legal arguments that he cannot be sentenced on both counts. LaDon, I know I need to sign you off. I can't thank you enough. It's been fun to have you here. Look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for having me. It was a great time. All right. Now, we are going to have to take a break. I'll be back here on the other side of this break here on Law & Crime, covering these trials gavel to gavel nationwide. Mm -hmm.